In 54 BC, Gaius Julius Caesar invaded the island of Britain. This was his second time on the island, with the first invasion coming to little in terms of territorial gain. Caesar pushed inward after landing a considerable force near modern-day Kent. Caesar's intentions seemed to be territorial expansion of the Roman Empire and maybe a bit of curiosity. Caesar encountered a small force of Britons and repelled them easily. However, Caesar was unable to keep the advance moving quickly due to losses in his fleet as storms caused considerable damage to the ships. The Romans had underestimated the strength of the channel waters and the fleet had to be repaired. The tribes of Britain nominated a warlord named Cassivellaunus to lead their forces against the foreign invasion. Cassivellaunus knew he had an impossible task and began a guerrilla campaign to move Caesar off the island. Caesar gained alliances with various other tribes and managed to put an end to the resistance. Cassivellaunus and his forces eventually negotiated surrender. Caesar established a small settlement on the island after securing peace and his mind already turned back to mainland Gaul. Caesar began receiving reports that unrest was building and, likely not having even one soldier to spare, crossed the channel with all forces, leaving no Roman soldiers behind to keep the peace or enforce Roman law. When peace negotiations concluded, Cassivellaunus agreed to no further hostilities, and the man left in charge was Comius, king of the Atrobates, who was an early ally of Caesar. Caesar intended Comius to be a placeholder until further Roman control could be established, but it would not be Caesar who would return. Comius invaded Gaul during the rebellion of Vercingetorix and fought in a few unsuccessful battles against Caesar and then retreated back to Britain. Comius's client kingdom was a success, and he managed to retain power. The Britons weathered the storm of Caesar's invasion, but the Romans would certainly return. The reigns of Augustus and Tiberius saw little to no interest in Britain. The Emperor Caligula, though, planned an invasion in 40 AD, and the results were interesting to say the least. Caligula knew that Roman emperors had to be legitimized by territorial expansion and success in battle, but it seems he did not want to take on any endeavor that may not have gone exactly as planned or possibly be dangerous to himself. Also, Caligula was somewhat mad. His invasion was a farce. Caligula lined his soldiers up at the channel, still on the shores of Gaul. The soldiers were ordered to attack the ocean and did so with limited zeal. Once Caligula proclaimed the battle won, he then had his soldiers collect seashells as spoils of war. His army marched back to Rome and he presented the shells as proof of victory. After Caligula's assassination in 41 AD, Claudius was raised to the purple. Claudius, just as Caligula before him, knew he required territorial gain and military achievement to submit his legitimacy. Claudius was a historian and had no military experience. Due to Claudius's many physical ailments and rumors of incompetency, he needed something to conquer. Britain seemed a good target and Claudius needed a reason to invade. The Roman god Terminus demands Rome's borders be expanded and Claudius bowed to Terminus's will. By 43 AD, Verica, who fancied himself a son of Comius, was deposed by hostile tribes. Verica so far had proved a good client king to Rome and kept the trade routes open between the island and Gaul. These routes were proving more and more lucrative for both sides and Rome had to protect them. It is possible that the reason Verica was under attack was that the other tribes were hoping to get a bigger piece of the pie. Also, according to the geographer Strabo, the Britons were paying heavy import and export taxes. Strabo wrote, They submit to heavy duties on the exports to Gaul and on the imports from there, which include ivory bracelets, necklaces, amber, and glassware, and similar petty goods. It is very likely that aristocratic social circles in Rome, who were more likely to use the types of finery from Britain, may have also pressured Claudius to protect the access. Exiles from Britain may have also been pleading their case before the emperor for aid. Both sides had a reason to fight, and Claudius assembled his forces for invasion. The army he formed also likely contained veterans who routed Neptune's forces for Caligula. Upon the invasion, most of the tribal leaders submitted to Roman rule and even delivered the Romans belligerent tribal chiefs as a sign of goodwill. The island was systematically divided into provinces as many of these chiefs died off. Slowly, the island was being assimilated into the Roman Empire. The invasion far exceeded Claudius's expectations. The Emperor Nero continued the slow crawl through Britain. 
According to Tacitus, nations were conquered and garrisons were strengthened. However, in 60 AD, Queen Boudicca's revolt began in earnest. The most numerous tribe in the region, the Brigantes, made up a large portion of the queen's army, and they would continue to be a problem for the Romans. Ineffectual governors came and went after Queen Boudicca was defeated. Britain settled into an uneasy peace. In 71 AD, the Emperor Vespasian decided to press forward into Britain and subjugate the island for good. Vespasian appointed Quintus Petilius Serralius to bring Roman order. He succeeded in pushing the Roman forces to the border of the highlands to the north. Serralius showed great strategic flexibility and set up his successors very well. Serralius was able to deal with tribes one at a time, as there is little evidence at this point that there were many tribes allying against the Romans. The tribes were being divided, conquered, and slowly Romanized. Sextus Julius Frontinus was next appointed and brought present-day Wales into the Roman fold. The legions were then moved north again to prepare for the invasion into the highlands, when the new governor was appointed named Gnaeus Julius Agricola. It would fall to him to finish the conquest of Britain. Agricola was originally from Gaul and was raised by a family of the Roman aristocracy. He would have most certainly received an education in the upper-class tradition and he entered public life in 58 AD. Agricola was attached to the second legion stationed in Britain and fought against the Boudicca uprising. This was likely his very first taste of combat. Most biographical information about Agricola is provided by his son-in-law, the great Roman historian Tacitus. Tacitus tends to paint a very rosy picture of Agricola, and therefore history seems to accept his version of the man. Agricola was no doubt accomplished in war and diplomacy, and one can see where Tacitus wanted to keep the image of his family in as good a light as possible. As soon as Agricola arrived in 77 AD, he received word a local Roman auxiliary unit was destroyed by a tribe called the Order Vices. The Order Vices most likely assumed the Romans would not pursue them as it was late September and the air was beginning to chill. Almost as if to set the pace for what was to come, Agricola did the opposite of what was expected and pursued the Order Vices and destroyed the forces he came into contact with. The Order Vices then fled to a nearby island called Anglesey. This island was special to the Britons due to it being a holy site of the Druids. The island was considered a sanctuary and previous Roman commanders allowed fleeing soldiers to rest there. Agricola marched to the island and had his soldiers cross the river to take it. With no time to build boats and the winter coming on faster by the day, Agricola had no time. The crossing was done by lighter auxiliaries and horsemen. The island signaled surrender when the Druids saw the Romans approaching. Agricola already had his first victory, and this seizure of a sanctuary island had to signal to the Britons that this new Roman commander was going to be more aggressive than his predecessors. By 78 AD, Agricola set his sights north and began to lay the framework for the invasion of the northern territory called Caledonia. The terrain was rough and the climate could be harsh. Also, many of the tribes further north were not yet pacified. These realities forced Agricola to consolidate his position rather than continue the maneuvers of the previous year. Agricola ordered construction of forts leading north with systems to protect supply lines. This framework will prove critical to the invasion. When the systems were completed by 79 AD and thus began invasion of forward momentum, Agricola overwhelmed several tribes as he pressed north, continuing to build forts in strategic locations along the way, forming a chain to move supplies, messages, and fast reinforcements. There is no record that any of Agricola's forts were ever seized in battle. By 80 AD, most of what is now lowland Scotland was overrun and being fortified more and more daily. Roman rule was being firmly established by competent hands. The expansion accelerated so fast that Agricola bypassed present-day Galloway towards the western coast nearest to Ireland. The Novante tribe held its ground, but were few in numbers and easily subdued as the rest before them. Tacitus does report Agricola met with minor kings from Ireland who may have been offering some kind of alliance. Agricola's march was starting to see more of this by 81 AD, and many tribes were simply surrendering to Rome. This king may have hoped to become a client king, but with the Romans making such complete advances, it is unlikely Rome was interested in allowing any local control. Agricola also began the construction of a navy and put it to use by 82 AD. 
It is assumed by Tacitus that the existence of this fleet is what brings the last of the Britons on Caledonia to decide to stand and fight. With the Roman fleet in full force, there was nowhere else to run. The Caledonian who fills the leadership role is named Calgacus. Next to nothing is known about Calgacus. It's estimated that his army comprised of around 30,000 soldiers at the formation of the Caledonian Confederacy. Whether Calgacus was competent or not, this effort may have been too little too late. Calgacus led a raid on the Roman camp to open his war. Agricola had gotten info about this attack and made preparations. Caldonians attacked the front gate and busted in during the night to cause mayhem and kill as many sleeping unprepared Romans as possible. Calgacus, perhaps showing his understanding of strategy, left part of his force outside the walls to watch for counterattack and to keep the escape route secure. Roman auxiliary stationed nearby outside the walls sounded an attack to attempt to trap the Caledonians inside the camp and kill them all. The Caledonians sounded a general retreat in time, and most seemed to have escaped. Despite being prepared for the attack, it was a psychological blow to Agricola and his forces. After the daring camp raid, Agricola decided a more aggressive approach was needed. The Romans pushed the Caledonians back and pursued them across the countryside. Eventually, they had to give battle. The Caledonians were running low on supplies and their situation was becoming dire. Tacitus wrote, They had at last learned that a common danger must be repulsed by a common effort. The call went out to form a host and warriors from across the land went on the move. A centralized flat plain was chosen called the Mons Grapius. Its location was the ideal choice to form an army quickly. After receiving word that battle was being offered, Agricola must have been pleased. However, the march was difficult, and good lines of retreat were scarce. Agricola chose to march without a baggage train to maintain speed and flexibility. If the Romans lost, it could be a disaster. Agricola's forces arrived on the battlefield in sight of the enemy. Calgacus had arranged his forces on the Grappian Hill overlooking the field. The Romans hastily constructed a camp and formed an attack plan. Caledonian chariots rode up and down the front of the Roman lines and jeered them to battle. The Romans formed a massive front rank of light infantry with a heavy infantry reserve led by Agricola. Closely ranked with the infantry were cavalry on both flanks. Caledonians deployed their infantry on the crest of the hill and the chariots moved to engage the Roman front lines. The Caledonian horsemen took up position on the flanks at the bottom of the hill. The chariots opened the battle by attacking and were destroyed by the auxiliaries. The wreckage of the chariots created a confusing situation in the middle and many of the infantry could not keep ranks. Agricola ordered his cavalry forward to engage the Caledonian horsemen. The Caledonians fled after a brief fight and the Romans pursued. Calgacus must have ordered a general attack as the Roman auxiliaries appeared to be in disarray. Although, being of noble birth, he may have been personally leading the chariot attack. In that case, he was already dead, leaving the army without central leadership. As the infantry came down the hill, Agricola ordered a full attack of his own, and the timing was perfect. The cavalry returned to find the Caledonian flank exposed as they had attempted to flank the confused Romans. The Caledonian cavalry were too few in number to help or support. Calgacus and his men were being surrounded as they were coming down the hill. The rout began. Agricola even took to horse to pursue the fleeing army, and the Caledonian casualties were very grim. Agricola claims to have killed 10,000 enemy while losing only 360. If true, this was one of the most complete victories by any Roman general ever and effectively ended any chance Britain would have of not being Romanized. Tacitus wrote, The next day revealed the full scale of victory. Everywhere, the silence of desolation. The Roman dead were buried nearby, and Tacitus, reflecting on their loss, wrote, It would not be inglorious to die at the very place where the world and nature end. Agricola is considered among the pantheon of great Romans. 
However, there have been questions in the past whether or not this battle even took place. Archaeological evidence has been hard to come by, and the battle itself seems to be such a complete victory that it may even border on fiction. Tacitus was also writing about Agricola as to provide a glowing eulogy of a family member, and has really every reason to portray his genius. Agricola, for his part, also wants to be seen as a conquering hero, and inflates the numbers and events thusly. However, the idea of an entire battle being fabricated is likely a form of more modern historical fantasy. Roman soldiers, officials, and colonists would have to all be complicit in a conspiracy to inflate the accomplishment of another Roman. It's hard to believe jealous and ambitious people putting themselves aside for Agricola's glory. Also, the aftermath of this battle does seem to end the Caledonian resistance and completes the Roman conquest of Britain. If the battle never happened, are we to assume they just disappeared? Not unlike the Romans of old, bold conjecture can sometimes be useful to inflate the egos of modern scholars. <laughs>